Hey everybody, Christy Glass coming to you from the land of Zoom. And actually I have some New Yorkers in the house today. It's a mother daughter duo. And this is so exciting for me because my own daughter has come of age and I was just FaceTiming with her the other day and she said, mom, I think I'm addicted to knitting, which is what every mother wants to hear. So I'm so excited to chat knitting today. Please introduce yourselves. Okay, so my name is Helen uh, George, but I'm also called Brenda. My Ravelry name is called uh, Helen HBG4, which are my initials. And my Instagram name is The Knit and Dark. Um, I'm a physician, um, I'm an anesthesiologist and also a pediatrician, but I've been knitting ever since I was around eight years old. I was taught in the church as a after-school program and I've been crocheting around that same time as well. I was taught by a family member. And, um, you know, I've just been knitting intermittently throughout the years. Um, I did my first test knit when I was 12 years old. Uh, <laughs> it was a bit of a disaster because I took it to school, so it got pretty dirty. It was like a natural cream color, um, but it was a successful uh, test knit. And um, I knitted throughout medical school um, just to keep my hands occupied so I didn't overeat. And, you know, because, you know, when you're studying all the time, you kind of snack on stuff. So Peanut I have my hands <laughs> occupied. Um, I did uh, win um, a design competition while I was in med school as well for a sweater. Um, after med school, I kind of put things down. I, I knitted maybe for about another year and then that was it until uh, my daughter was born. And then during pregnancy, I crocheted a, a baby blanket for her, uh, knitted a onesie and um, really didn't do too much after that until she was about 12. And then I started in her sweater and then put that down for like five to six years, uh, completed it on her 18th birthday, which it did fit her. Oh, amazing. Um, you and, know that was my question. Yeah. And so basically that was in 2014. And since 2014, I've been knitting more regular, using YouTube to learn the new stitches, um, crocheting more as well. Um, and uh that's my story. So I basically knit when I'm trying to catch up on, you know, on old uh, TV episodes. So <laughs> watching well, Netflix. Well, I have lots of follow-up questions for you, but why don't you introduce your daughter to us? All right. So this is my daughter, Aaliyah. Uh, she's my only child. <laughs> and I taught Aaliyah to knit when she was around eight years old. Oh, same and, age. Um, cool. Basically her, her story really... I, she asked me to make her stuff after that sweater I finished on her 18th birthday. And I said, you know how to knit, do it yourself. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I did learn how to knit when I was eight. Nothing really came out good. It's a lot of squares and triangles that are somewhere around the house. Um, but yeah, my name is Aaliyah. Um, my Ravelry name is Summerva and my Instagram is Black Med Knits because I'm a med student. Um, so I kind of stopped knitting for a pretty decent amount of time until she made finished making me the sweater. I picked it up again when I was in college. So like junior year around when I was studying to take the MCAT. And that was also my first Vogue like during junior year of college. So I went to Vogue Knit Live in New York and I've been knitting pretty regularly since. I try to make at least one thing a year. Um, now I'm a med student. I, with the pandemic, I was knitting a lot more, especially with the videos, because everything got put online. And I usually went to class. So the transition from showing up to class to, I guess I have to watch everything on my laptop. I'll keep myself busy with some knitting. And now- yeah, Elia, don't you find that when you're on the screen, you tend to get just more drowsy? Like you just do, right? Yeah, especially when it's Zoom lecture for yes. like 8 to 4 p.m. Yes. And then another thing after that. Yes, but then, so the knitting kind of helps you stay awake, right? Yeah. Okay, keep going, keep going. So yeah, I knit a lot during like the Zoom meetings and like the longer conferences that we have now. And especially for studying for like shelf exams and stuff like that, because now I'm in the hospital doing like clinical rotations. There's a lot of videos to watch to like learn the material that you need to use for the rotation, but they're not 
super engaging because you're just kind of watching a video. It's not a lecture where you can interact. So I knit a lot through that. I knit my first pair of socks this year. So that was very exciting. I knit one sock, it took me like a month. And then there was a one week sock knitting challenge and I knit my next like actual pair during that week. So it's very productive week for my knitting. And then I also got through a whole lot of studying that week too. So it worked for me. Who was doing the one week sock knitting challenge? Was that Hey Brownberry or? I think it was Earth Tone Earth Girl. Tones Girl. Yeah. Earth Tones Girl, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Now, okay, first of all, I, I'm so excited that you guys are both doctors and soon to be doctors. So I, because when I saw your handle was the knitting doc, I thought it meant you were like fixing all the knitting. <laughs> I thought that was so amusing. <laughs> Then, yeah, then you had your then you had your February challenge and you had yourself in full scrubs. I'm like, oh my gosh, she's actually a knitting doctor. <laughs> right. <laughs> because I had seen you do these incredible Vogue pieces for the fashion show. I think that's the first time we met was at the yes. fashion show a few years ago. I yes. think it's this purple, it had more than one. But you know, yeah, I was um I remember it was um it was two items. It, there was a dress and there was like, uh, you know, with the Vogue uh, fashion shows, I tend to knit like the, the, the knitted coats or big sweat, you know, sweat. Yes, it tends yes. to be knitted coats that yeah. um, I, I tend to knit. So one was a crochet dress and the other one was a knitted coat. Yeah, it was, um, I, remember, <laughs> I specifically remember that. Uh, it was done in, um, it was this old, I think it was like a twinkle, coat or something like that it was an old-fashioned coat that had a big shawl collar and I thought it was a little bit outdated so I turned the collar into a hood and I did it in Malabrigo Rasta and the first one I did um, oh. it, it came out a little bit too big so I tried to block it and I put it in the, um, the dryer and it came out, it shrunk, it felted and came out so small, I couldn't, I, I couldn't rescue it. So um, the deadline date to do the, you know, to complete it was like two weeks. So then I knitted another one. Um, I didn't have enough of the same color yarn, so I had to mix it with some kind of purple uh, Malibu Rasta, but it turned out okay. And I came, I think it was first runner up or something. Yeah, I remember um, you doing another round on the runway. Yes. What we're talking about is the Readers on the Runway fashion show where people who read Vogue magazine, they submit their finished object that they got from the magazine, like from the pages of the magazine. So that's what we're, we're talking about. Now, before I go any further, people are going to want to know what you're wearing because these two items, I've never seen these items before. So tell us about them. Okay. So this actually um, is a vintage sweater. Um, I think I recall it was an Annie Blatt design. This was actually done um, either just after I finished medical school or medical school. So this is really old. Um, I don't even know if the pattern is in Ravelry because it's really old. Um, you, you're talking about maybe 30 years old or something like that. So it's done in this, um, like a, a shiny kind of ribbon and uh, Angora, but it was very simple to make. You know, it's really just knit and stock and stitch, reverse stock and stitch in, you know, um, it was just really simple. So is uh, that considered intarsia when you sort of flip over to the next wall? Yes, it, it is an intarsia because yeah. I use two separate balls of wall, but you know, it kind of goes at a diagonal angle. But this, this was like a really easy, simple knit in that I could read or watch TV because I'm one of those knitters that I, I can't just knit. I've got to be doing something else. So got to be reading, got to be watching TV, in a conversation, but I can't just knit alone. So I really tend to have like simple stitches that I can, I don't have to look at what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these days I'm kind of trying to do, you know, more intricate stuff. So I do have to look, but I try to have episodes where I may just do a, a garment where I don't have to really pay much attention to it. Mm -hmm. How about you, Leah? What are you wearing? So this is the hopeful in flight from the Rescue Endangered by Design book. Yeah, so it's like, there's a big feather on it. It's kind of hard to fit in the frame. And then there's like birds that are supposed to, I think just go across the hood, but I put them on the front also. Here we go. So yeah, they're also on the hood. Cause I was like, the front's kind of plain. I like added just like a subtle cable. Um, I 
joined their knit along, but it was during my like pediatrics rotation. So then I got bogged down with studying. So I kind of had like a front, a back and half an arm by the time it was done. It took me a while, eventually I finished and they were like, oh, it looks really good. So I was like, okay, doesn't matter that I wasn't done in time. I was, I finished. And yeah. this is um like double stitch embroidery. So that just took me forever once it came to it. I didn't think it would, but stitching every single stitch by hand after you've already knit it and following a pattern is, it's a lot of work. Yeah, it was great, you know, cause we actually found the book at the last Vogue Knit and Live in 2020. January 2020 that's where we actually saw the book and yeah. um, so it was really nice especially I think by buying it a part of the donation went to help the endangered rest you know the endangered mm -hmm. wildlife so you know there's a lot of designs that we want to do eventually it's a gorgeous book and it's yeah. like a pattern book but also a coffee table book like it's a very yes. special volume yes. so when you did the double stitch Aaliyah was the sleeve flat or in the round so you knit the sleeves flat and oh, then good. actually in their like Facebook group, they had like a little tutorial on how to do the double stitching. And she was like, I do it before I seam the sleeve or else it gets kind of difficult to do the top part. Once That's you're all the way into the sleeve and it's attached, it's kind of difficult to make sure that you're not picking up the back of the sleeve at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I did it flat and then seamed everything up. And so I had a sweater with one sleeve for a little while. Yeah. I was thinking you'd have to do it flat because it's so much double stitching. Did you double stitch the birds too, or was that intarsia? Yeah. So this is all double stitched on. I didn't do an intarsia project until I think a few months after I finished this. And even then it's just kind of like a big triangle mm -hmm. on the sweater. It's nothing really complicated. Nice. So now Helen, Brenda, cause I always know you as Helen, but then I was noticing on your Instagram, you have Brenda. So I was like, I could have sworn her name was Helen. <laughs> So Helen Brenda, do I detect a little accent? Do you have roots in the UK? Yes, I'm actually um, a Londoner originally. So I was born and raised in London um, and uh, educated there, went to school there, went to medical school there, and then came the year after I completed you know, medical school. I worked for a year, like equivalent to an intern, mm -hmm. and then came here to the US. So yeah, that's so where my English accent comes from. So do you notice a difference in knitting world there versus here? Do you want to um, comment on that? You, you know, when I was actually there, I, you know, the knitting world here has expanded so much for me. When I was knitting back home, it was really for myself. I didn't have any knitting groups. I just bought knitting magazines and, you know, went through the patterns there. I bought wool. Um, I did go to my local yarn shop. So I looked all over, you know, uh, basically the West End of London, which is central London, uh, for knit knitting shops, which were close to the intercollegiate university hall that I lived in. And I'd go there, and because I was a medical student, I didn't have much money, so I'd look, in, look through the sales, you know, yes. boxes, <laughs> to see yes. what I could find. But, you know, what I really remember, there were two local yarn stores that I really loved. Um, one was in a place called uh, Holborn, I don't know if it still exists. And the other one was Patricia Roberts shop. I don't know if you know her, or remember her, but she was a, a British designer who used to make these intricate um, designs. She has some old books. I haven't seen anything more recent from her, but you know, I used to go to her shop and you know, buy, it was pretty expensive at the time, but I'd buy the sale yarns, whatever was on sale. I try and accumulate enough to make um, a sweater. And obviously this one, uh, it was Annie Black, but I didn't have, you know, this was from the sale, you know, bin. So obviously I didn't have enough to make a whole sweater, but I accumulated bits and pieces so I could make something. So I did a lot of intarsia work <laughs> back then. Um, I love that. But yeah, but um, here, um, as I said, I really didn't get back into knitting until 2014. Mm -hmm. And then I started to look online. I started to discover the YouTube um, tutorials and started to, you know, uh, I reinstated my subscription to Vogue Knitting uh, magazine. And uh, then 2016 is when I discovered Vogue Knitting Live in New York. And I was like, oh my goodness, I've been missing this all these years. And I went there and I was astonished that there were so many people from all over the world. And, you know, and, and it was just meeting people and talking to people. And, you know, that's the first year I went. And I remember the fashion show, you know, um, time came 
and I found a seat, sat down, and I was actually sitting next to two English doctors, and I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh, you know, we started talking. They said, oh, we came all the way from England for this fashion show, and I'm like, oh, really? So I was astonished, and you know, and that's really when the knitting world opened up for me. So, you know, I'd say, yes, I'm more involved with knitting. Instagram, my cousin introduced me to uh, knitting on Instagram, and I'm like, oh my gosh, look at all these people that, you know, I, I didn't realize, you know, because there's there, there are a few, you know, well-known people in the knitting world, like Creative CC and um, Gigi Maiden. Gigi and, you know, there's, what's the other? Christy. Christy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a few people, I, I, you know, I put them, you know, S Stephen West, you know, basically, you know, I'm, I, I feel like I'm a, a group, a knitting groupie. So yes. if you're famous and I see you, I'm gonna say hi, can I, can we take a selfie together? So yeah, so you'll see, you know, you'll see a few uh, well-known faces on my Instagram page that I've taken pictures with. Obviously we, you know, it's gonna be a while before I end up having selfie photos again with someone yeah. else that's, you know, well-known, yeah. but yeah. But knitting world is open, especially on Instagram yeah. and YouTube, you know, I follow the podcast as well. Well, I think that Vogue, they just had their 10 year anniversary. So it's not like you missed much, you know, I mean, you only missed the first couple of years, same with me, you know, I wasn't going until around 2014, 15 also. So I think it just had to sort of gain traction. And then mm -hmm. all of us sitting at home, crocheting and knitting alone, we're like, wait, there's more. <laughs> yes. And so it has been so, so great. I mean, for as much as I really hate the negative parts of social media it does feel like we're in this really cool club that we all do this together right yes so tell me a little bit about because the only so my only context for the medical profession is my own dad was a dentist which is not the same but he is a dentist and then i have mostly female friends who are married to men in medical school and that's a really hard journey for them and so all I hear is just how hard it is for them to be married to this person who's just always busy and stressed out. So my impression is that this journey you both have been on has been quite a big challenge. And I'm surprised that knitting can fit into it. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. And tell so, me if I'm wrong and tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I mean, it is a lot of like hustle and bustle and work, especially for a student. I mean, my school in particular is pass fail, which a lot of medical schools are transitioning to. So at least for the first two years, it's just, you still have to work pretty hard, but it's not like, oh, I need to make sure I get 100% on every exam or it's gonna be a problem because like someone's 100% is the same as someone else's like 70 mm -hmm. because on the transcript, it just says pass or fail. Um, we have a knitting club at my school actually and it was started by, I think they're fourth years now. So they're about to graduate. And she like came to med school and was like, I don't know, cause she didn't like going to class. So then she would knit while watching the Zoom lectures, uh, not Zoom, but you know, like the video recorded lectures. Mm -hmm. And then I took it over and I was president for the last two years. I just handed it down to a first year. Um, and then kind of with the pandemic, cause we would usually do like a circle. So we'd sit in the lobby and everyone would knit and like chat about how their day is going, how the last week's been. I kind of transitioned it to, I can drop off supplies at your apartment and then we can have like a Zoom meeting if that works. So we did that a couple of times. And I think that's what they're planning on doing from now on. But there's a lot of downtime in med school, especially if you're like doing it right. So you make it, you make it so that you've got time to like enjoy yourself. You don't need to, work so hard that you've got no free time because then you're going to be miserable for four years straight and that's terrible yeah but I think that I found that the free time or then like you kind of fit it into studying time it sounds like the knitting circle really played an important role actually for all of you kind of as mentoring each other and sort of checking in on your mental health yeah so a lot of the people who came ended up being like people that I still spend time with. So even though we're not knitting together or crocheting, we still talk and it's, it has worked out pretty well to be like a good check-in. So even now that we're not doing the circle, it's like my friend has been picking up knitting a lot more. So now she's like, we like have a little group chat and we're like, 
oh, this is what I'm working on. And like, she just made a skirt. She's like, look at my skirt that I just finished. Or sometimes if my mom is doing like a order from somewhere and they've got a good sale, I'll send her the link and she'll, my mom will order for her too. Yeah. <laughs> so that way she can get, get it without having to like figure out the shipping and everything. So it becomes yeah. like a whole family affair. Yeah, I love that. Now, have you been able to share this at all with patients? Like, have you ever met patients in your field? I mean, maybe not. I'm just thinking pediatrician, maybe you wouldn't with a child. An anesthesiologist, you're just putting your patients to sleep, so there's no time to chat. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes we'll chat beforehand, you know, before they go to sleep. If, you know, it, if there's like downtime, we're waiting for the case to start. And it depends, you know, sometimes you, you get a report with a, a particular patient and you'll discuss anything. I mean, I found out a lot of information that's like nothing to do with medicine. But, you know, um, it, I don't know if I've actually come across someone who's actually a knitter. Mm. Um, you know, it, I think, yes, I, I have actually, um, I think the, maybe a year ago, I met this lady who was actually, um, knitting and she was doing back loop knitting and I was like what is that mm -hmm. so I discovered you know something new um it was sorry not back loop knitting back loop uh, crocheting oh I see mm -hmm. but yeah so I can the back loop yeah yes mm -hmm. that's it so mm -hmm. you know th there's little things that you kind of pick up you know and I you know um but in general yeah we we talk and then they go to sleep yeah <laughs> how to so, knitting and work you know I, it's as Leah said, during med school, I used to knit while I was studying. Mm. Um, and as I, because back in the day, it wasn't really computer, it wasn't computerized. Right. It was all books. Mm -hmm. So I used to read my book and knit at the same time. Um, now, um, working as an anesthesiologist is very long hours. So a lot of times I will come home and by the time I've sorted everything out, it's, it's too late to do anything. Um, I don't really get much sleep during the week. I may sleep two to four hours. So occasionally I might just pick something up at 12 midnight and knit till like two in the morning while I'm trying to catch up on the DVR. Um, but in general, it's like maybe at weekends, um, it's intermittent. It's like, it's not a consistent thing. Um, I may have a few work in progress, but I try to complete something, you know, before I start too many, you know, knitting projects um but i could see if you were having that type of schedule you would have to be more of a monogamous knitter i would think yes yes yeah. no i mean i still got i've still got a few projects <laughs> on my knitting needles so i've got like about four or five okay and i'm trying to i'm completing them you know yeah. i've completed i completed one uh last week saturday and um i have another sweater that i'm trying to complete before i go on to any of the, the other projects yeah, I was thinking about I doing the charity knit nights that I've been doing for my knit and skate program. I've met some people who have specific knitting for kind of a medical environment. So meaning um, for Alzheimer's patients, they're they're making blankets for them. Or I had um, hugs through shrugs on, and she provides kits for mothers who end up in the hospital. Maybe they're planning on it, maybe they're not. You know, with like a very ill child. And so we've just had this discussion come up about how knitting plays a role when you're in medical crisis, you know, prayer shawls, people do that. Or just like you were saying, waiting for answers. You know, I, I don't, I haven't had um, experience with chemotherapy, but I just wonder if that's something someone can do while they're getting their treatments, you know? So I just was wondering if you had come across it. That's what I was thinking about. My daughter's pediatrician is a knitter. And so whenever we go in, she's like, okay, let's do the shots and let's talk about Pippa. She's like, okay, now let's talk about knitting. Like she, she wants to talk about it all. And she's like, the child care first. I'm like, well, she's healthy. She just needs a stick. You know, she just needs, yeah, she's got a wire and sticker. She's fine. Um, so it's very fun to, to talk with her about that. Okay, so I want to talk about your recent Readers on the Runway, Helen, because you did this, I don't know if you have it nearby, but you made this, it was like a lacy Shirley Payton dress, right? Yes. Oh yes. my gosh, what so a piece that of work. Was, yeah, you you said it was easy. It was easy, actually. I was very surprised. I mean, except you, when you made two bags. Yeah, well, uh -oh. what the it, daughter I keeping it real. <laughs> so it's um it was a lacy dress that I found on old Vogue Knitted magazine. I think it was like a summer or spring of 2007. So once when I discovered 
discovered Ravelry a few years ago, you know, um, I put it in my Ravelry queue to, to be knitted. Um, didn't get around to it until uh, about last year. But a few years ago, you know, I was trying to find the yarn and it was supposed to be a cotton yarn. And I found another Ravelry, uh, per, you know, uh, person who had knitted a wedding dress using the yarn. And she had maybe about 25 extra balls left over. So she, I got it for a really, really good deal. So I purchased the yarn about four years ago, had it sitting in my stash. And then when the pandemic started, it, my hours of work actually changed drastically. So, you know, it, it was, we started, uh, basically I went from full-time five to seven days a week to doing three days, approximately three to four days a week, but it's 12 hour shifts. And most of my shifts were at night. Um, so I said, okay, you know, since I had days where I wasn't working, I'd be home. And I just felt that I needed to have a project that I, I wasn't taking out of the house because I didn't want it to get contaminated. And I decided that I was going to do this project, this lace, lacy dress by Shirley Payden. And I sat down, looked at it. It was, it's a really, really simple lace. It looks complicated, but it was straightforward. It was my first lacy project. And, um, you know, I altered it a bit in that I did it. I did the, um, the skirt in the round and then all the other sections were done as separate panels. So, you know, there was a few alterations. The only problem was at the end, when I went to try on the dress, I realized that I did two backs for the top instead of a back and a front. And I couldn't figure out why, because I said, you know, I know I altered it a little bit, but it shouldn't be fitting this way. And then I realized what I did, but it, it fit perfectly. I mean, I actually had the, the tension swatch uh, done properly. It looks so right, good. I knew what the measurements were. And once I sewed it up, then I said, oh my gosh, I don't know if this is gonna fit me the way it should, but it, it did. Well, yeah, and plus um, the pandemic, we're all like, are my pants going to fit? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that's, a, that's incredible. You look, you look so amazing in it. And we did a virtual Readers on the Runway this year. And so it was so fun because you guys were both in it and then you were recording each other. And I, I loved that moment. And, and that's when I finally made the connection. Oh my gosh, this is the mother-daughter knitting team. Love it. Yes, yes. So talk about, do you guys get to knit together? Is that something you you consciously do? Like, let's get together and knit. Does that happen? Yeah. So when Lalia comes home, you know, some, she's home most weekends. So when she comes home, then we'll sit down and, you know, she'll, she'll binge watch stuff on TV and, you know, we'll pick up our knitting and we'll knit together. And like when she was over in university, she went to university in Florida. Um, that's prior to med school. And um, she was learning how to do stuff at the time. And we would face, she would FaceTime me and says, mom, okay, how do I do this? And I'd say, okay, you know, put your camera on and show me what you're doing. And then I show her how to do stuff or I'd send her YouTube links. But basically that's how she learned how to, to do things. And then also I belong to the uh, Big Apple Knitting Guilds in New York. And um, I joined them a few years ago and they have every summer, well, except the last year, we used to have um, a, a big meeting where you get to learn new techniques. So we have separate groups and there, there is, you know, it, and you can invite a guest. Um, you don't have to be a member um, to actually go to these class, you know, this, that, that actual uh, class that they have. And um, they had, um, I had, to, I'm an English thrower. Um, I tried to flick also, but Aaliyah tried knitting with the English style and it wasn't very good. Her tension was off. Her pearls were not, her pearling it was, was twisted. twisted. And was um, so I said, okay, let's sign up for a uh, continental knitting. Cause I thought, okay, that's a way that I could learn to knit faster. She was a natural for it. I realized that her technique, it was continental knittedness for her. Once she started continental knitting, her, her speed picked up, her knitting was even, it, it, you know, I said, okay, that's the reason why. She's not an English thrower, she's a continental knitter. I still couldn't do it. With continental knitting, my, my tension is off, it's, my stitches are too tight, I have to look at what I'm doing, you know. So continental knitting is not for me, but it is for her. 
And, um, but, you know, I really miss those meetings that we had with the BAKG, that's what we abbreviated to. Um, we have a, a good size membership and that room was full. We'd have about 200 people at a time sometimes. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we do it on Zoom now. Mm -hmm. Talk about more New York knitting, you guys. I mean, you have mentioned Vogue Knitting Live, which is a one-time event in January. What other local yarn shops or besides the, the Knitting Guild, what else can you tell us about New York knitting? I feel like it's kind of hard because we don't live in Manhattan to find a local yarn shop. I was actually looking them up to see if there were any, like maybe up in Westchester that we could go to. And there's a website that's like, oh, find your local yarn store. And there's like four listed on there and all four of them are closed. And I was like, oh, okay. So I guess if I really want to go find some yarn, I have to go downtown. But then my local yarn shop is the house. I just come home oh. and <laughs> yarn from her because she has a yarn room. Yeah. yeah. My I daughter always room. she's like, when are you gonna open your yarn store, mom? You have enough wool. So you have a whole room. Talk about I have room. a whole room. I'm too embarrassed to show it. It's literally what <laughs> floor to ceiling of wool. There's no, there's literally maybe a few feet to move in there. Um, <laughs> it's, it's also a library. So it's, there's like bookshelves with books on them. Right. It's not just yarn. And uh, it's um, basically if she needs yarn, I tell her, don't go and buy. Just tell me what the project is and come in my yarn room and let's have a look. And now that she's more experienced, she gets the luxury of actually having the better quality yarns now to choose from. But um, I do most of my yarn shopping online. So, you know, I have a few websites that I really do love to shop from. Um, I try not to now because I really have more than enough. As my daughter told me, I have a, what would you call it? Beyond a lifetime? Yeah, I guess <laughs> Nash expect can see beyond lifespan. Like, it's gonna outlive you. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and I did bring yarn with me from England uh, when, I, when I immigrated here. Uh, some of it's been used. Um, a lot of it has is still there in my stash. I uh, do think that would be such a cool series. I mean, it's too it's too personal to ask people, but you know, we would love seeing people's stashes. Like, <laughs> can I go into your yarn room? Like, we would love that. So I just love hearing about it because you know what? Listen, this is our passion. It's our collection. Like, it's okay. You know, yeah. I see people who. They build garages, you know, in Manhattan, you, you walk along and you'll see this garage open and there's like all these levels, it's full of cars. You know, <laughs> we can have a room full of yarn, it's fine. I would be remiss if I didn't ask what it's been like to be frontline workers during this past year. So we're, we're talking on the year anniversary of the pandemic and it was very, very intense in New York City for, you know, I don't know, months and months, but we definitely, you know, being the I was living in the hot spot within the hot spot at the time. It was just, you know, Elmer's hospital and you guys are in the Bronx, I believe. Um, so talk about what this year has been like for you as, as medical in the medical profession. Well, as, as I said, I think, um, initially I saw it coming. <laughs> I think when, um, when the ship landed and was isolated off the West coast and, um, I knew there was going to be a lot of changes, but as I said, my hours did change. We started working shift work. Um, as I said, I'm an anesthesiologist and we became ICU um, intensive care um, physicians. So our operating room was converted to an intensive care unit. Um, we, we did do surgery, but it was extremely rare. It had to be the real emergencies only. Um, like all the electives were put off. All the electives were postponed until June from like, I think April till June. Um, so we, as I said, I worked shift work. So I had more days off, but my days at work were totally intensive. Um, because I was in full PPE, I literally hydrate and eat before I went into work and my mask went on and didn't come off until it was time to go home. And as I, these, these were 12 hour shifts, I uh, really didn't get any time to sleep and I did a lot of nights. So, you know, I'd start working from 7 p.m. till 7 a.m. and then have an hour to sign out the patients and then go home. And then that was my downtime. So, you know, I would use that time. I really stopped watching the TV. 
um, the news. I would just maybe see the highlights um, at, of what the main events were for today or you know what the mayor was saying or the governor was saying. And then I'd, uh, if, it if I didn't have to go back to work that night, then I would sit down and watch something light on TV and knit. Um, it, the only thing is that I'm a traveler. I love to travel. Um, and I used to knit on the planes or crochet on the planes and, you know, my downtime on vacations, you know, if I wasn't out into doing some entertainment or visiting someplace, I, I would knit. And um, I haven't traveled since December 2019. <laughs> and I would travel every other month. That, that was me. Um, so that I really miss. Um, I'm trying to get out of the city, but every time I, I try to make a move, there's a new rule and I haven't been able to go. Yeah, it's such so. a fluid situation, right? You're like, oh, shoot, you know, yeah, I get it. Yeah. How about so, you, Leah? And you, you mentioned you've gone more to Zoom classes. Yeah, so we kind of transitioned from, we've always had the access to do lectures like online remotely. I can't focus like that, so I would go to lecture they transitioned it to entirely remote. And then a lot of our lectures were just pre-recorded from the previous year. Um, and then over the summer, when it was kind of like that between time, we kind of started these virtual clerkships. So the time we would have been in the hospital turned into, okay, here's a Zoom meeting about something that you would have learned in person, but we're not gonna do that. So we're gonna do it via Zoom. Um, for me, I think, as a third year med student with learning how every clerkship functions, um, I would say the pandemic was kind of helpful because appointment times went from 15 minutes to maybe 45. So there's no way I would have been able to do like a full you know, history and like actually get to know the patient a little bit and like get my exam done in 15 minutes as it was before. But with 45, there's like, plenty of time for me to talk to the patient, learn what I need to learn, and then for the attending to come in and like, you know, cover everything else. And it, there's no rush because the times between the appointments it, were changed too. So you went from having like maybe 50 patients a day to 10, which isn't great for people who need to get checkups and come in for care. But I can say that it was definitely helpful for medical students. I think me and a lot of my classmates were like, you know what? It's bad that this is happening, but it's definitely beneficial for our learning. That's interesting. I didn't think about that before. So do you know what your discipline's going to be? Um, I'm kind of between OBGYN and psychiatry. So mm. Wow, those are so different. different. <laughs> those are so different. Love that. Oh, very fascinating. Love that. Back to knitting. Thank you for commenting on that. I Did you guys stay free of COVID? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, we, we all contracted COVID um, just around Christmas, New Year. Her dad got it first and then we, we got infected. Um, so we were all isolated at the same time between Christmas and New Year. Um, but we all recovered. Of 2020. 20, no, of this, 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 yeah, yeah, 20, this 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 2021. 2021. Right. Okay. Yeah. So we're immune <laughs> for now, but you know, we, we are going to get the vaccine, but we have to wait for 90 days. But right. yeah, but because I'm high risk, I was actually given those monoclonal antibodies. So I definitely have antibodies in me. <laughs> so, you know, but you know, um, I, I think what's happened is that we found that the majority of health workers um, who are getting infected, we're not getting infected from the patients. Hmm. We're getting infected from other, either outside, the majority of us are getting infected from outside, from hmm. either close family members who might have got infected and that's how you get infected. Or if somebody's not social distancing at work, say another colleague, you know, if they're eating lunch together and they don't have their PPE on. So they're trying to make sure that we stay social distance at work, even when we're eating. Um, you know, that, that's, that's the main thing. So it's, we're not really getting it from patients because when you're with patients, you're, you're in full gear um, and everyone gets tested, but 
even the patients who are in the hospital, some of those that get infected from the visitors who are coming from outside. So, yeah, yeah. I've had a few patients yeah. who were COVID free when they came into the hospital and then like they had a family member who visited and a few days later, the family member's like, oh, I have COVID. And then the patient, like a couple of days later, now they're positive. And then, you know, the patients aren't in their own rooms most of the time. So then their neighbor may or may not have COVID. So it's just kind of a huge cycle of, well, they came in, they didn't have COVID. Now they have COVID. Oh, this nurse accidentally exposed the other nurses. Mm -hmm. So now everyone's exposed. Mm -hmm. Now the patients are also exposed depending on whether or not they, you know, you just had contact. So not necessarily like, oh, they didn't wear their mask. It was just, oh, they had contact with someone who had COVID. So I think it's, it's not like people are sneezing on each other or coughing on each right. other. It's just kind of incidental. Oh no. Yeah. It's not like people are being, um, careless you know people are doing the best they can and then yeah. things slip through the cracks i had a friend who just got over it and she was like i am doing everything i'm supposed to do how did i get this <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i think many people feel that way you know who are just like you said they're saying what what are the rules right now what are my government officials saying what is my boss saying and so she was floored she's like i cannot believe i got this i i have been in my apartment for a year, you know? So yeah. it's very, it's very frustrating. I think what I hate the most about it, cause you mentioned earlier, selfies at Vogue, which is one of our favorite things. And even doing the fashion show, I mean, yes, our fashion show, we're close together. We're in close quarters back there. Yeah. And just thinking about how the human body, the human being is the enemy. Like we are all each other's enemy. That is so hard about this. And I know we all just can't wait to be able to feel safe enough to go in for the hug or the selfie again, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, oh Even I mean, you know, I just love being around people, being around events. I mean, I don't have to participate. I'm just one of those people. As long as I'm sitting and there's stuff happening around me, I'm happy with that. But, you know, you're, you're looking at it and you're thinking, when are we going to go back to that? I know. It's going to be a long time. I know. Um, you know, Every six months, you keep thinking, okay, I, I don't think it's going to happen for another year, maybe another six months. And then six months comes along and you're saying, okay, not this year, maybe next year. Don't do it. Don't say it, Helen Brenda. Sorry. <laughs> well, they're changing but, the rules with all the vaccines now. So yeah, 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 it's true. Well, it's it's interesting because we were signed up for vaccine. I just put us on the list because you can get on the list. And my daughter, who's 15, got a notification that she got an appointment and we're like, What? So she went in, we were just like, well, just go because who knows? So she went and they're like, no, turn around, out. And like, well, we, she's like, I have the email. I thought it wasn't approved for children under 16. It wasn't. So we were confused, but you know how everything's a fluid situation. We're like, okay, we better go, we better go. <laughs> so she couldn't get it. But then my other daughter who's 19, she was diagnosed with cancer last year. And so she gets put up on the list. And she is, I, I think, fully recovered. It was melanoma stage one. So we caught it early, but she's, she's like, I'm one of those people that can maybe get it before you. And I'm like, just get it. You know, if you can get it, get it because, you know, we, she's still not a year out of her diagnosis. And so I think, you know, it's nice that they have different categories and we're really trying to pay attention to all of that, you know? Yeah. Anyways, well, let's go back to knitting. Anything else you want to share about knitting before we go? And thank you for letting me ask those doctor questions, doctors in Manhattan or doctors in New York questions. <laughs> uh, I don't really know. Is What's there on anything? your needles right now? Oh, man, so many things. I <laughs> am <laughs> I'm a problem knitter. I pick up a lot of projects and then don't finish many of them. They just kind of like sit on my needles. Um, I have the winter light shawl from Stephen West's Hiber Knit Along. That's been on my needles for basically since December. Um, what else do I have? I oh, have. Yeah, were you too sick to knit when you guys had COVID? No, I was, I had like a little bit of a cough. I was actually pretty much fine. You lost your sense of smell. Yeah, I lost my sense of smell and had some uh, myalgia, which is basically back pain. That was my, my problem. Okay. Um, and, um, yeah. otherwise it, a, a bit of tiny cough and, um, 
headaches in the morning and uh, that was it. But we, we made the effort to walk outside with our dogs. Mm-hmm. So we take, you know, we take walks with the dogs once, once a day, which was really good for, <laughs> for us because we were stuck in the house. We couldn't go anywhere, not even the supermarket. So yeah, yeah, we had true. a whole lot of food in the house, which yeah. by the end of those 10 days was depleted. But, you know, we managed, we were good. Yeah. But that's the thing that knitting has been so good because we do, even if your case is mild, and we all know that not everyone's case is mild, but the majority is a mild case, you have to quarantine. So you yeah. have all this knitting time. Yes. Yeah. So I had the winter light shawl. Um, right now, I think I have like a tricolor coat sweater. It's a Vogue pattern that I've worked on two rows since about January. So you can see how that's going. <laughs> um, and then I'm trying to do the Swatch It Up like 2021 project. So it's like every week they release a new block. So it's kind of to learn new stitches. Cool. I'm on week three. They're on week six or seven. That's all right. Yeah. I also that's finished the first a- knit. So like oh. that's why everything else got kind of pushed to the wayside because I was trying to finish that. Yeah, because you have to meet the deadline for the test knit. Now, will the blocks be like a, a blanket or something? They're going to be a cardigan. A cardigan? Cool. Like a big, um, you know, kind of like patchwork, but mm-hmm. I'm doing it all in the same color, so it's not so patchy. Cool. And what about you? Yeah, I have um, I have a couple things on my needles. I have um, a few things that actually started at, from the Vogue classes, Vogue knitting uh, classes. Um, one is um, uh, Melissa Leapman, uh double-sided cable scarf. Cool. Um, actually, I have it on the table here. Oh, good. <laughs> I can show it to you. It's like, a, it's like, it, it's, I'm making Hold it in this um, Cascade uh, Eco Duo <gasps> yarn. So that's the front. How oh, that, that, those cables are so textured. And this oh, is the back. So yeah, it's double-sided cable, which is, it's really soft yarn. Um, It's Angora and uh, wool. Uh, So this is one. I'm also making a a cowl, a brioche cowl. um, That was also started (laughs) in a Vogue class as well um, by Michelle. I think she's called the Pitarati. I can't remember, I'm so embarrassed. Um, I just remember her first name is Michelle, but she has a lot of, YouTube, um, you know, tutorials. And then my main thing that I'm actually doing, uh, this is, I had just finished um, on Saturday is called a, a tie sweater. It's or tea sweater. It's um, a test knit. So that's like a short sleeve, like t-shirt, which came out really nice. So I used um, Madeline Tosh Pashima, uh, Pashmina. Um, yes. um, so it's really beautiful and soft. So I'm going to model that outside in the cold sunshine today. So Leah will take some photos of me for that. And I'll post that on my Instagram page. And right now, what I'm trying to complete is called a punk sweater. And it's by Busteria. I think she's from somewhere from in Europe, uh, Eastern Europe. Um, it's a really beautiful sweater. I loved it when I saw it. It's mostly, it's stranded knitting. Um, and uh, I didn't quite like all the designs, the logos, the punk logos. I'm a Star Wars fan. I'm a great Disney fan, big Disney fan. We're big Disney fans, right? Did you right? see Raya yet? Did you watch Raya and the Last Dragon? Oh. We're about, we can watch that today, actually. Today. While we're okay. <laughs> so we're huge Disney fans and love Star Wars as well. We, we've done a, the Disney Star Wars cruise. It's on the Disney ship. And so I decided, I saw someone on Instagram had done um, a Star Wars version of the punk sweater. So that's what I did. So I actually looked for different Intarsia patterns and, you know, basically logos. And so I'm doing a Star Wars version of this punk sweater. So I've almost finished the whole body, um, just about to start the hem, and then I'll do the sleeves. So that's my project that I have on my needles that I really want to complete before I do anything else. Love it. Did you see the tennis uh, Star Wars book that came out? Yes, I purchased that one. Oh, good, 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 good. <laughs> I, did. I, I I purchased that one. I saw it coming out and I wait and then when it was released, I purchased that. Yes. That's fine. Love it. 
Yeah. Well, I have loved chatting with you ladies so much today. It's so inspiring to see that you've passed on the tradition to your daughter. Do Does your mother knit? Helen? No, unfortunately, my mother doesn't knit. She sews. You, so, oh, you did mention that. Yeah, so she's a sewer, um, but she doesn't knit or crochet. So this is what I learned outside of the home. Yeah, I love that. Well, yeah. you're a dynamic duo, and thank you so much for all of your work in the community and for sharing a little bit about it with us today. And I am looking forward to seeing you when it's safe again. <laughs> Yes. We don't know when it is, but I'm looking forward to seeing you at a Vogue in the near future. How about that? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> or maybe Rhinebeck. Or maybe Rhinebeck. Maybe Rhinebeck will happen. All right. So, you know, there's a chance. Yes. So either way, we will see each other and we will take our selfie. We're going to do it. Yes. <laughs> so good to see you guys and happy Mother's Day to you. And you. we will say goodbye. Okay. Bye. Bye.